everyone, and welcome back to Don't Open That Door. I'm Justin, one of the assistant editors at the local paper. I'm Nico, and I am the Wellerman, only I'm not bringing you sugar, tea, and rum. I'm bringing you dead horses, water damage, and trauma. Hmm. Wow. Well, I'm Dan, the bracelet. <laughs> what? <laughs> We, we take all kinds here at DOTD, folks. And we are here today to discuss The Ring, the 2002 remake of the 1998 Japanese Ringu. So this was directed by Gore Verbinski, starring Naomi Watts as Rachel, Martin Henderson as Noah, David Dorfman as Aiden, Brian Cox as Richard Morgan, and DeVay Chase as Samara. So... We open with two teenage girls watching TV, and they basically discuss a mysterious videotape that supposedly kills the people who watch it in seven days. One of them admits that she actually watched the tape last week, and while her friend steps away, she's immediately killed. I mean, you, you just, you pretty much hate to see it. But Dan, what follows after that? So now we're introduced to Rachel, who's a reporter, and her son Aiden, who is very mature for his young age. Rachel is the aunt of a girl who was killed at the beginning, and at her sister's behest, she begins to investigate what really happened. She heads to the Shelter Mountain Inn where the girl first saw the video, and she watches the cursed videotape, which contains several seemingly random clips, for herself. That doesn't really work in her favor, as she immediately receives a phone call with a mysterious voice on the other end telling her, Seven Days. So, Rachel hits up her baby daddy, Noah, and after he watches the tape, they make a copy of it for investigative purposes. As they go through the investigation, Rachel begins to be haunted by the spirit of the tape, and many, many disconcerting things start to happen to her. And together with Noah, they find that a woman who appears on the tape hails from Moesco Island, and she committed suicide after her horses drowned themselves. Fucking mm. brutal. Unfortunately for Rachel, though, Aiden also watches the tape because he's a kid, and now he has seven days. Plot thickens. Dan, what's going to happen now? So Rachel heads to Moesco Island, and Noel heads to the local insane asylum, where the woman from the island was temporarily held. Rachel discovers that the woman had a daughter, Samara, and she caused strange occurrences to happen... People would hear voices and see images and things like that. It is revealed that Samara's mother ended up killing her by throwing her into a well at Shelter Mountain Inn, and the ring that the movie's title is kind of based off is actually the uh, halo of light that she saw when she looked up as this well was sort of closed and there's a little halo of light up at the top. Well, Rachel heads into the well, and Noah lets her know that her seven days have passed. She's miraculously survived. Rachel also finds Samara's body and they remove it so that she can be properly buried and laid to rest. So Rachel heads home pretty, pretty happy because she believes that the curse has been broken. And it has, right, Nico? Yeah, the movie ends and uh, let's get into audio visuals. No, uh, just kidding. It hasn't. The following morning, Noah, who saw the tape a day after Rachel, is killed by Samara in his apartment. Extremely traumatized, Rachel tries to think through why she was spared while Noah wasn't, and she realizes that the only thing she did differently from Noah was make a copy of the tape for someone else to see. She then takes Aiden and helps him make a copy of the tape to pass on to some poor, unsuspecting soul. Well, that's not a very happy end, but let's talk about something good. Visuals. Start us off, Nico. How are the visuals here? So I think the cinematography is really, really nice in this, particularly given that it's a film from, you know, what, 2002? There are a number of really, really good set pieces and shots throughout the movie, and one thing that I think is particularly nice about that is... I think oftentimes in horror films, there are a lot of, um, or tend to be moments where it's like, oh, there's just one or two good scenes, but I really think that this is just really shot well throughout. But the only other thing that I will briefly mention on, just because I don't want to take all the limelight, is I really dig the usage of color in this movie. This is a very bleak movie, of course. We, uh, we see that in both the, the time period that it was made in, being the 2000s where everything looked sort of like it was run through the dishwasher and just the fact that this is you know a dour bleak movie but 
when we have flashes of color, they overtake the screen and they do so in these scenes that are very sort of laden heavily with symbolism, like the, the tree and where we get just this fountains of red spewing into the window. And I just I loved that. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I agree with you. I liked the visuals. I thought, I remember when I saw this movie for the first time back in 02, around there, I should say, it was, it looked really good then and it still holds up now. There's a scene with the horse where the horse kind of gets scared and bolts and drowns itself. I thought that was done really well. Like it doesn't look excessively fake. It like the horse, you know, kind of like yeets itself off the side of a ship. And that's what I imagine that would look like. And even the scenes with Rachel and kind of the stuff that she's experiencing, I thought they're all done really well. And one thing about this movie was I don't think it tried to do things that it couldn't. So everything it did was kind of within the scope of their power to make look good and make look realistic. There were no like effects that I thought were really bad or like, oh, the CG was really horrible here. Like there's a part where there's a fly on a screen and Rachel mm -hmm. kind of takes it off the screen and it's real. That was kind of cool. That was pretty cool. Like, yeah, it's just a cool thing to do. So I like the visuals a lot. Dan, anything to add to that? Yeah, sort of kind of going off of Nico's dishwasher and color <laughs> thing. <laughs> so interestingly enough, they actually decided that everything would be tinged the color green to help mm. give the, the movie sort of a, a, an unnatural, almost like sickly kind of feel to it. So that was actually sort of purposely done there. And apparently the lighting was done so that nobody had a shadow. I kind of really? want to go back Wait, and rewatch parts. Yeah, I I never, I didn't really catch that while watching it. I should have gone back to, you know, check a couple spots, but apparently that's true. That's no, no shadow. Huh? I wonder what the point of that is, like what the, what that's supposed to give us. I'm sure if I had like a day to think about it, I could get something, but off the top of my head, I think that's just cool. Yeah, I don't know. I, yeah. I would guess maybe like unknown sense of creepiness. You know, like sometimes... Kind of like Uncanny Valley-ish thing? Sort of, yeah. You know, sometimes like something will put you a little bit off, but you don't really know why or can't explain yeah. how, you know? Well, Nico, I mean, it could be like... Because you know in dreams, like people don't have shadows. Like no one dreams shadows on people. Like in your dreams, if you see someone, like they Is don't have true? a shadow. Yeah, it's a known like... It's a known fact. Like, there are no shadows in dreams. Huh. Well, anyways, while Nico looks that up, Dan, why don't you go ahead and uh, mm. tell us about the audio? So, I mean, the audio is pretty good. Uh, the score, as Justin pointed out to me, actually, it was written and done by uh, Hans Zimmer. You know Hans Zimmer. Everyone at this point kind of knows Hans Zimmer. And... I thought it was pretty well done. Um, and I thought it was kind of tame for, for a Hans Zimmer track. Um, Honestly, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, especially yes. as the Hans Zimmer that we know now anyways. But I mean, it was really well done. And I thought that all the music and everything very well accentuated what was happening in the film. And I, th I thought it was great. Agreed, agreed, agreed. Nico, as far as the sonic seasonings on this one, how do you feel about the audio? Yeah, I'm going to echo a lot of what Dan said here. I, it, it is kind of nuts to think that this is a, a Hans Zimmer joint because you don't have his usual sort of like bombastic brass sections or anything. But the motifs in this movie and the themes are really, really well done. It's the kind of vibe that I would liken it to is almost kind of like a more modern tubular bell sort of vibe, like just not necessarily fantastic sounding. And by that, I mean like fantasy-esque, like Lord of the Rings or something. But it is something that is designed to sort of, you know, keep you on your toes and not be, you know, really sure what's going on at any given point when the themes are happening. And I really liked that. Solid all around. So one thing that I do want to discuss with you guys is Samara. So the actual... I don't know if you could really say monster, but the actual kind of Samara killing people, we only really get one good, good, good shot of Samara, and that's at the very end of the movie. We get her victims, though. We do get mm -hmm. her victims, but specifically speaking, Samara. So how do you feel about the movie kind of holding its gunpowder there and 
saving it till the very end for her to do that iconic coming out of the TV. How do you feel about that? I liked it. You know, it kind of leaves a, a sense of suspense and mystery isn't quite the right word. Like, I don't know, suspense, I guess, is the best way I can say it. And keeps you guessing. And, oh, well, because like you said, Nico, we do see her her victims. So the whole time you're kind of like, oh, what, what does she look like or what does she do to to make this happen to people, which I guess we don't really see, but still, I, I enjoyed it. Okay. And Nico, I mean, you, you're in agreement there or disagree? I agree. Something that I will mention about Samara really quick is I, I, I bet that there was a lot of differing opinions on this, but I personally, I really like how they included the sort of the filter of the film grain on her person when she was walking out and, you know, killing dude like she had that sort of overlay of everything looked really grainy and gritty and granular and i think that was a really cool effect was it necessary probably not was it cool i think so didn't she like right. glitch out once or twice or something she did i think yeah. yeah that was i don't know i don't know how i feel about that like it was cool but i i think i would have found her scarier if that didn't happen but it was a cool effect. I, I'm of two minds, I guess. So, and we'll be talking a little bit more about the comparison between the two, but as I recall, the way Samara looked in the Japanese version back when she went by Sadako is she looked a lot more corpse-like almost, in, mm -hmm. in my opinion, and they went for that take versus the kind of almost, like Nico was describing, technology-esque kind of look. But... Before we get to that and comparing the two, we asked this as well for the other one, but is this a mystery with horror or is this horror with mystery? Do you think, Nico? Yes. Yes to which? <laughs> yes to both. Go ahead, Dan. I think it straddles the line very well. I, I think it is both equally. I think mm. that it's very, very mystery driven. There's large, large, large chunks of the movie where I didn't feel scared or any sort of impending sense of dread or anything really that, that I would consider to be in a horror movie. But then there are parts here and there that, that were. And I, I think it kind of straddled that line just very well. It's interesting because, of, let me put it like this. If you removed the fact or the supernatural element of it and instead there was a killer and this killer would kill people seven days after they watch this movie, right? I almost feel like this movie would be shot like 75% the same way because like you see the victims, like a lot of it reminded me of a traditional almost like slasher flick where you'd come up on the victims and everyone would be like, oh shit, like how, how could this happen? I mean, in this movie, it's a little bit different because we know how it happened. Like they got killed because they watched the movie. Mm -hmm. But... Like, just the way that it happened, and you're right, Dan, there are moments where it's not really super scary or tense. It, it's more so, like, there's a whole scene with Noah kind of at the psych ward trying to get access to these files. And there's a little bit of humor there. There's a little bit of trying to find out, like, mystery-ish feeling. But horror is not one of the feelings you get while he's in that ward. And similarly... I almost kind of feel like unsettling is probably a better term for it. Like when Rachel goes to the island, Moesco Island, it's unsettling. Like the whole island feels like it's over, like it's overcast and foggy and like just not like an ideal it's vacation very spot. ominous. Yeah. And like she's investigating a mystery there, but there's not really a ton that screams like horror, horror. You know what I mean? So I do agree with Dan and you, I guess, Nico, that it kind of does <laughs> straddle straddle that fence a little bit. Something that I think is essential to this movie is there isn't any real moment-to-moment -moment scares present in this sort of source material for Sadako or Samara. Like, it's once you get the tape, it's like, oh, you got seven days, homie. So, you know, you do you for that week. 
you know, live your life. But once those seven days are up, it becomes the, you know, the sense of impending doom. And we have that sense of impending doom at two points, really. At the beginning of the movie with the two teenagers, which I, I really dig that opening. I think that was a, just a great way to display this sort of tone of everything. And then at the end with the, the scene where Samara finally, you know, <sighs> offs dude. But the, the, just the fact that there's no... I guess moment to moment danger isn't really the right word, but it's just a very tense kind of situation more so than dangerous. I think that's a good point. And I mean, yeah, you know, throughout the whole movie, you kind of know she's got seven days and in the middle of the movie is like the mystery of the movie. I think that that Mm -hmm, mystery mm -hmm. part, because she's got time now, of course we do have a deadline, but it's, you you got a few days and then, so you, you, you're right, you have the, the sort of, uh, I guess I'm sort of going on what you said, I feel like you have the, the horror at the beginning and the horror at the end in the middle is like mystery with every once in a while a little touch of horror, but mostly yeah. mystery. So based on that, would you guys say this is kind of a good entry point to people for horror? So like, let's say you were trying to get somebody into horror, particularly somebody who might not like super scary or super gory films, is this a good entry point, do you think, for them? Or would you say, nah, it's still not the greatest of things if someone's afraid of being scared? I think it's a, a really wonderful point of entry into the genre personally, and particularly for people our age and older than us. You know, people, uh, or I should say uh, Gen Z, they don't have the memories of like growing up with VHS tapes and stuff like that. They didn't have this mm, sort of mm-hmm. similar, like, not folklore but cultural experience like you find an old tape and it's like oh what's on this like this could be any number of things and there's this sort of like air of mystery to it and there it it has all this sort of subtext just because there is this literally just a black box that could have any number of things on it you don't know and i think that almost makes it a little timeless this is gonna sound weird but I almost feel like VHS are the books of visual media. Okay. Because media nowadays can be stored on these tiny ass like thumb drives or like if the movie were to be remade nowadays, maybe they would just find like a USB stick. And when you put it in your computer, it like auto plays a video or something like that. I feel like if they remade it today, we would get something like unfriended almost. Mm. Now they did have a 2017 thing that I know absolutely nothing about, but... I haven't seen it either. Eh. But I mean, it's interesting to consider that point, Nico, that just the look of a videotape, I mean, I remember taping over a bunch of shit when I was a kid. I remember also like when something was cool on TV, like I would tape it mm-hmm. so that I could like watch it later. And that was that was good times. But I want to get to a little quick kind of almost consideration between the two movies, the original Japanese version and this one. So the two movies are alike in quite a lot of ways, but they've also got some differences. I wanted to talk through a couple of them with you guys. So first off, the start of the movie is pretty much one-to-one with the Japanese version. You open with the scene with the two teenage girls. You've got the funeral. You've got, you know, the reporter who's kind of linked into the whole deal. Um, Even, you know, down to the single mother having a kid. Now, the first difference is Aiden is he's almost deliberately more mature and deliberately more of a plot point than his counterpart in the Japanese film. Do you think there's a particular reason for that? Is that maybe to show that the absence of his mother has kind of forced him to mature quickly? Is that what we're supposed to get from that, do you think, Nico? Yeah, I I think it's really just a case of this is a child who has had to grow up under not terrible circumstances but not ideal circumstances and it seems that he has a much more vicarious isn't the right word relationship with his mother but there's some distance there it seems Mm. much less familial and almost more like he views her as a colleague agreed and dan you know aiden refers to his mother as rachel you know by her first name we also are treated to a scene where She's looking for a black dress of hers, and he's already got it laid out for her. Mm -hmm. And he's like, it was a little bit wrinkled. And he was dressed for the funeral before she even was. Yeah. What does that say about their relationship? 
Uh, that I feel like the little kid's got his shit together and his mom doesn't. Um, <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't know. I mean, to me, the, the super maturity of Aiden was just kind of creepy. And I thought just like him getting out the dress and calling his mom by her first name all the time. And, and, and also in like a creepy way. I mean, I know sometimes people do that and you know, I personally don't, but like I, he does it in, in just a creepy way, I think kind of going up that there's also the character of Noah and he is the role you know of Rachel's ex which is played very well in the Japanese version as well I thought the two of them pretty much fulfilled the same role I didn't really see too 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 many differences between the two of them you guys agree in Ringu wasn't the the ex-husband wasn't he the one who had the the powers oh you're right he was they got a vision he got a vision Mm -hmm. yeah 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 you're right. You're absolutely right. Like he had like a straight up like vision about it. Yeah. So perhaps the biggest difference between the two films though is the island. So in this movie, they kind of track it down because they stretch the film and see a lighthouse outside of the kind of the boundaries of the film. And Rachel has some incredible luck while looking up lighthouses in, I guess, the state, potentially the country. It's a big tome. And she finds it, and they track it down that way. In the Japanese version, they there's like a saying about like goblins in the brine or something like that, and they track that down to the specific island um, because it's a saying that comes from there. However, it really differentiates because in the Japanese version, Sadako's mother was a psychic, and Sadako was an even more powerful psychic. And... They knew that that was definitely Sadako's mother, but the father was kind of hinted at. It was like an almost kind of cosmic horror thing. Like they said, maybe it was something from the sea or something like that that could potentially have been her father. Versus in this one, Samara was very much a adopted child, I believe, is what they were kind of hinting at, at least. How do you guys feel about that main change between like the mother being a psychic versus a horse breeder? And how do you feel about that? I feel like it's easier to sell to American audiences that yes. someone's mom is a horse breeder than a psychic. And <laughs> just speaking on that sort of like marketing thing, it is much easier to show the visuals of, like you said, horse McGee just fucking jumping off a boat as opposed to, you know where my findings out, like psychic abilities and shit. So in, in just a purely means to an end way, I, I I think they made the right decision. See, I actually am in a little bit of disagreement there with that. Because IMO, in this movie, Sadako is literally portrayed as like evil for no reason. Because there's a little tape and then they go like, well, why do you hurt people? And she's like, I don't know. I just like doing it. <laughs> and in the Japanese version, Sadako was angry at her mother's death. Like, that's what really pissed her off there. So I prefer it that way. But also, I don't know. I feel like this is a movie about fucking dying after you watch a tape in seven days. I don't think the mom being a psychic was too too big of a bridge to jump over. I, I, I don't think so. I don't think so, personally. But, Dan, I know you must know the truth. I'm kind of with you on that, Justin. I feel like... Well, actually, I'm kind of with you on both. I, I definitely think that the the... American version, The Ring, is very much based in more realistic situations. Um, mm-hmm. And of course, we have uh, Samara being, you know, one with sort of other world supernatural abilities. But that's like the only thing that is really supernatural. Whereas in the Japanese version, there's a lot more magical supernatural properties and, and things happening. And I, I kind of liked that a little bit better. Because I, I think you're right, Justin. I think it gives Sadako more of a justification. And Samara is just kind of like, yeah, I just want to kill people. But her being the only supernatural thing, it just doesn't really make sense where she came from or how she got these abilities. Not that we need to have her entire backstory about all that. But to me, it just felt a little out of place. It was kind of like, well, where where did any of this come from? And not not come from as in how did she get the powers, but like, it just feels like the movie is one thing and then you have Samara and she's just kind of standalone by herself 
And so I'm just like, well, I don't, I don't quite understand that. It, it just didn't mesh well to me. But in the Japanese version, because we were introduced to more psychic abilities and things, I, I feel that Sadako's reasoning and, and her, the reason for her being evil is just better and makes more sense, I think. Okay, okay. And really, really, really quick, this movie really catapulted the concept of the, you know, Asian horror remake. This was kind of like the big, the big one. And then after this, you got remakes of The Grudge. You got, you know, even... Dark Waters, too. Yeah, yeah Dark Water. Um, there's, oh, God, what is it? It's like, don't... There's one with, like, a Open cell phone. Door. <laughs> there's one with, like, a cell phone. I forget the name of it. I'll remember it later. But I know it's what like, you're talking about. Fuck, didn't it have Jessica Alba in it or something? No, Jessica Alba was in another remake, The Eye. The Eye, yeah, yeah. But this one was about, like, a cell phone call, last call. I don't know what it was, but there was another one. Basically, mm. there was a slew of remakes after this, you know, kind of taking popular, specifically Asian horror movies. It happened in other cultures as well, but specifically with Asian horror movies, like, those were kind of gobbled up. Um, how do you feel about kind of the remake frenzy that happens, and to a certain degree is still happening? I mean, we're supposed to be getting a Train to Busan remake, and I don't is know. Is a remake or a sequel? That. I heard it was an American remake. Yeah, either way is bad. <laughs> So, I mean, how do you feel about that? Do you think it's a good thing, you know, that it opens up more people to it so they can go back and watch the original, much like the three of us did? Or do you think it's a situation where people should read fucking subtitles? I'm going to speak as an... Well, yes, people should always read fucking subtitles. Just get over yourself right now. But I'm going to speak as an educator here for a second. I think that just getting involved in the genre is a valuable thing i think we can okay. all agree with that and i think if this introduces you to more horror and specifically horror outside of the stuff that you would normally go see then i think that's a really good thing and i can't really bring myself to at least with this film con cast that as a negative thing if you get what i mean mm -hmm. dan thoughts there I think it's a little bit of a both, both of a positive and negative. I I agree with Nico, and I think that there's nothing wrong with doing remakes in a different culture. So, like, you know, from Japanese to American, or even if, you know, other cultures take American movies and, you know, localize them or whatever. I, you know, I think that's fine. But I think that when it's done too much and too often, it can kind of water down the the genre and the culture that it's coming from, I guess, because uh, again, you know, the, the, the differences between the two films, the Japanese version, again, like, like I was kind of getting at earlier is definitely more supernatural, which a lot of other cultures outside of America believe more in supernatural stuff than Americans do. Mm -hmm. And right. I think that, you know, if, if Americans really just watch the American version, then they might, and they know that there's a, the original version, they might get an incorrect, incorrect opinion of what other cultures, films and things are, especially if you're not taking into context their mm. cultures. Sure. Which again, I think is fine to do sometimes, but sometimes I think it just kind of waters things down when you do it too much. So I'm cool with, you know, a few major horror movies, you know, Japanese or other culture or horror movies coming to America being remade, but I just don't want it done too much because I, I do want to go and explore the other culture and go, okay, this is a remake. I liked that. Let me watch the original. Oh shit. The original is cool too. Now let me check out other Japanese horror that right. hasn't been remade and that I'm not comparing to an American version or whatever. I will say, Nico, I was going to maybe have a little bit of a different opinion, but your point was very good about Thank it you. kind of getting you into horror or into a certain thing. So I was kind of just coming out of my little chicken shit phase when I saw this movie for the first time. I actually think this and maybe one or two other movies. The Blair Witch Project was another one, but this and like a couple other movies were like movies I used. And that's why I asked earlier on, do you think this would be something good for someone who maybe is a little bit scared or doesn't like horror so much? Because that was me. Oh, interesting. And 
this movie was, don't get me wrong, like, I was still, like, imagining, like, what it would be like to be at the bottom of a well. <laughs> but oh, yeah. I definitely thought that it, it gave me a little bit of an entrance into horror. But then also, you know, like, talking to my friends about the movie, and someone was like, well, you know that, like, this was actually originally, you know, like, a Japanese movie, right? And I was like, oh, really? And, you know, same thing for, like, The Grudge. You know, like, knowing that there was a, a different movie that it stemmed from, I think it's a good thing. I think the bad thing comes when you never pursue it further. Mm -hmm. Like if your conception of the ring was just this American remake, I, I, I mean, this is going to kind of spoil my opinion a little bit of what I think of the movie, but I would almost feel like you're doing yourself an injustice if you don't go see the original Japanese version, because personally I like that version better. And I don't know. I just feel like this doesn't hit the same points for me. So I think it's good insofar as raising awareness, but it can be bad if like you never bother to check it out, you know? So th that's my two cents. That's my two cents. Now, there's something that's kind of been on the back of my mind here, which is VHS and spreading, you know, killing through a VHS. How effective do you think that actually is? Like, do you think Samara actually kills a lot of people? I think so. I think because it's going to grow exponentially. If people have to create copies, you got the original, and then a decade later, now you got like hundreds of different copies. So Samara is getting a lot busier real quick. So I think at the beginning, it, it would be slow. Business would be slow for her. Um, and then later on, I think it's just going to get, you know, more and more, more and more deaths. It's probably not necessarily the most efficient way, but I think over time it'll, it'll build. I think a gun you know? would be more efficient. <laughs> you know, compound so, interest kind of. But my thing is this. So you talk about making copies and I did want to touch on that very briefly. How the flying fuck are you supposed to figure that out? That you got to make a copy and show it to someone else. Yeah, that's true too. Most people wouldn't think to do that. And you've only got seven days to figure that out. So is your first reaction to seeing a creepy ass tape, yo, let me dub this over real quick. And, um, <laughs> you know, like that, that's what it's going to be. I don't, I don't, I don't think so. You know, the only reason that Rachel made a copy is because she wanted to like study it. And mm -hmm. for some reason, I guess Noah was like, yeah, make me a copy so I can study it. I personally wouldn't have copied shit, so I either died for sure, but I don't know. I just feel like if Sadako really wanted it, it, it could have been like, you get a call, and maybe the call explains a little bit more. Like, <laughs> Here are the terms and conditions <laughs> of the curse. <laughs> You've been cursed by Sadako. No, or sorry, Samara. But like, here's what you have to do. If you can show this tape to someone else within seven days, then you will be free. If Fucking not, music playing in the background. <laughs> You'll die in seven days. Call this number back to see how many days you have left. And then, like, there we go. To check your balance. <laughs> <laughs> pretty much. Pretty much. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe that's just, maybe that's just my two cents. You know, and in, in looking about how technology has advanced, I feel like she probably kills, like, one person every, like, five years. That's about it. I mean, think about where the tape was, too. The tape was in a motel room in this hotel in, like, the goddamn, you know, middle of nowhere. How many people were really choosing that to watch? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you'd rather watch something that you know what the fuck it is. Like, if you saw, like, a random blank-looking videotape, would you really watch it? Back in the if day, had, I'd be curious. If you had, like, Lion King, though? No, Lion King I mean, gets it every time. Yeah, Lion King is a good ass movie. <laughs> All right then, so there you go. Like you you would you would watch that. Like I feel like you would pick a movie you knew versus and in fact, didn't they say the only reason that the the teenagers even picked up that movie in the first place was cuz they were trying to like tape a football game, so they grabbed it thinking it was kind of like a blank tape or something mm. that they could uh tape Genuinely, over. Genuinely, I don't remember, but that sounds possible. I'm pretty I'm pretty sure that's what they said. Like they were trying to tape a football game or something. And that's when that shit happened. Ironic. So before we get into the what would you do, I want to touch on some themes here. Nico, um, what do you think are some themes in this movie? 
So parenting in particular, but more deep than that, I think there is a theme of birth and like the trauma of it. We see eventually that it's Samara's mother who tosses her down the well. And you can sort of think about that almost as a metaphor for trying to yearn for the time when she was either still an infant or still in the womb or still just like not really her own kind of agent at this point because there's a whole bunch of regret in this movie from the adult characters like you know she was never supposed to be born or like things could have been so much easier if blah 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 didn't happen and seeing that literally she's just tossed down into a dark wet place where it's just her and I guess tuberculosis like it makes sense to me to think, look, I don't know what's in a fucking well. Have you been in a well? Yeah. When were you in a well? When were you in a well? Bro, where do you think I got water from back in the day, son? Oh, yeah, you, yeah, yeah, okay. Mm. Dan? I think we had, ain't, ain't no deer park in Trinidad? Well, <laughs> I've never been in a well. <laughs> but yeah, birth. I think for me, and it's interesting to compare the two, but motherhood across the two movies is viewed kind of differently. When you look at motherhood in the original one, she's almost kind of, I don't want to say struggling a little bit more, but she doesn't appear to have all the power and agency that Rachel does in this one. Mm -hmm. In this one, you know, Rachel, I'm assuming a boss or some kind of superior walks up to her after she kind of like insults someone over the phone and he's like, you're fired. And she's like, no, I'm not. I'm working on too good of a story. And he's like, well, what is it? And you can tell that she has a lot of sway. Like, no one at that job tells her what to do. She tells people what to do. So she's extremely successful. But the price that she's paid for that is she doesn't get to spend a lot of time with her son, Aiden. So I do think that's kind of an interesting, I guess, kind of duality almost. And this second piece wasn't super clear to me. But does Noah also work at that same newspaper? Or is he kind of tangentially related? I thought he did. Yeah, I don't know that he works with the... I think he's tangentially related. I don't think he's employed by the newspaper, but maybe they, like, hire him out for contractor-type shit or something sometimes. Yeah, because he does video stuff, right? Like, that's what mm -hmm. he does? Yeah. All right, all right, all right. Dan, anything you can think of as far as, like, a theme goes? Um, Not really, aside from child abuse, unfortunately. Trauma. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that, that's mostly what I got. All right. Okay, okay, okay. Trauma. So, it's what I got. Yeah. So time for the what would you do. Oof. And this is going to be spectacularly short. <laughs> um, let's take it back to 2002. So uh, I'm going to spike my hair. And um, if you found a random ass videotape, right? Let's say the three of us are watching this videotape. We're in the inn or something like that. And Nico's like, yo, guys, it's a blank videotape. We should totally watch it. Dan, what would you say? I'd probably do it, yeah. All right, yeah, I'd probably be like, all right, let's see what's up. Yeah, yeah. So we're all dead. <laughs> we, we, see all, we see all the images and the phone calls and then, like, the voices. Who picks up the phone? Who, who's the one who picks up the phone after the phone rings? I feel like I'd pick it up. Yeah, it might be you, Nico. So Nico picks it up and voice, like, seven days. What are you going to do? I, I'd be like, say, say, what? Say again? Huh? Click. I <laughs> and so, I thought we would just gotten trolled or something. I would have thought this is some weird fucking concoction that you would come up with, Justin. It's always fucking me. Yep. But I do want to say, first off, that would take extreme planning, and I'd be very proud of myself. I'd be proud I of you to too. That. But secondly, if we didn't know about the legend of the tape, I mean, we'd probably just die, right? Like you yeah. would assume I'm I was just like a great call. Up. Yeah. But let's say we did know about the legend of the tape. And we're like, oh, this is the tape that kills people. Son of a bitch. God damn it. Just my luck. <laughs> How would you try? I mean, would you even try to solve it? Like, what would you do? I don't know. Okay, is this 30-year-old us in 2002? Or is this like 11-year-old us in 2002? <laughs> That's a big <laughs> fucking difference. 30. Okay. I feel like at this point in my life, I, I would try to solve it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, back when I was 11 I was just I don't know what the fuck I would have played 
fucking Mario Kart for seven days. <laughs> well, that was odd. But, <laughs> but now... She comes through the end at Rainbow Road, yeah. covered in, like, stars and shit. <laughs> no, you can hit her with the blue turtle shell, though. When oh, she, yeah! <laughs> you, know, you know she's in first place, so... I know. Listen, like, Dan's Mario Kart character wouldn't let him go. Like, Dan, we have too good of a thing going. I'll protect you. <laughs> Fucking baby Mario and who the fuck else was it? The the goddamn Koopa. the Koopa Troopa, Koop, the Koopa. Yeah. So Yo, just red shell Samara. Red shell, red shell Samara to death, bro. I did totem, but, totem Koopa. Oh, uh, oh, Nico, yeah. was that your combination? The baby character and the Koopa? Would you rock? Oh it? no, I had um a baby Mario and baby Luigi because I was just doing yeah. chomp all day. True. For the audience who wants to know, I was always a uh, Diddy Kong and um, baby Bowser. Good times, but. Yeah, so you would try and track that joint down? I think so. All right. Okay, okay, okay. I mean, what would you do, though? Because at least in the Japanese one, you had that phrase to like try and translate or like chase it down. I don't know fuck all about stretching the tape. I would never have seen that shit. I feel like I would watch it over and over and over, and then eventually mm. something would like jump out. I wouldn't figure about stretching the tape or doing whatever like you, but like, like you said, but... I I think I would just watch it so many times that I would finally like catch something that that would get me there. So now we're moving on to the critic score, and unfortunately, audience, Rotten Tomatoes is down. Of all the luck tonight, uh, Rotten Tomatoes is down. But we can quickly see that it apparently has a seventy-one percent. That can't be right. The Ring has a seventy-one percent. The two thousand two version on Rotten Tomatoes. I am surprised it's not higher. Okay. So, first off, go ahead and give me your scores and just your quick general thoughts about the movie. And we'll lead with you, Dan. You rarely lead these forays. Mm, true. So, my general thoughts, it's hard, having seen Ringu first, it's hard for me not to compare to the original. Try as I mm. might, I still feel that I, I do. I feel that this was a good remake but not a great remake. I thought it was a little watered down, I think, compared to the original. And I could feel that it was more Hollywoodified. I feel that like a lot of the effects and sort of the, the technical aspects were maybe a little bit better. But I personally found Ringu to be much more creepy. And especially when we think about the last scene you know, when she comes, or not oh last scene, God. I guess, but when she comes out of the, yeah. the TV, the iconic scene in the, in Ringu was just really fucking good. Yo. And creepy and so effective. Far away, like one of the scariest things I've seen on the pod is that yeah. scene. The movement alone, like the body yeah. movement. Yeah. And on this one, I feel like it was almost lackluster. Like it, it didn't, mm. it was kind of cool. And like Nico had mentioned before, the effects on her and everything were cool, but it wasn't scary or anything to me. So again, I know I kind of compared it to the original Ringu, but kind of even standalone. I thought it was good, but I didn't really find it all that scary. And I kind of watched it like, damn, this is what caught America by storm for a couple of years. Like it was good, but I didn't think it was that good. But all in all, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it a 75. I pretty much echo every single thought you had, Dan. But in my opinion, a remake should be compared to the original. I think it's unfair to compare, like, for example, sometimes people will compare, like, prestige horror to, like, Midsummer or Hereditary, and I'm always just like, all right, well, fuck off, because, like, you can't always compare, like, every single prestige horror movie to, like, two of the greatest prestige horror movies ever made, you know? That's just looking for, like, a losing fight. But... This one, I agree with you, Dan. It felt watered down. It, especially nowadays, and given the context of everything that happened with Parasite, I feel like almost, I don't know, there's like a little something in me, despite what I said earlier on the pod, that I don't want to say I hold it against the movie because I don't. But if you're going to do it, do it right. You know what I mean? And I think it's a passable remake, just not an amazing one. So I give this a 68 because I do think it has large cultural relevance. I do think that, you know, it's worth viewing. And 
I just feel like if you like this, watch the Japanese one. You'll like it a lot more. But Nico, I defer to you. So as usual, I uh, think a little higher of the movie than you two, but um, I think we could probably all see that coming. This is, uh, like y'all said, it is not a great remake, but I do think it's a great movie. I have really, really enjoyed watching this. I think it was well made. There are certainly a lot of issues that we've talked about on the pod that are all valid and have their own merit, but just as an experience on its own and i'm going to try and do my damnedest in viewing this as just a standalone thing i think it's a fun experience i think it's one of the easily one of the better movies of the early 2000s by a mile but keeping all that in mind i am gonna give this an 83 Mm. all right so let's go ahead and uh, throw it all down on the table would you recommend this one? For sure, yeah. I think I would. I would as well, if only for the cultural relevance. Now, does this get the golden seal of approval? No. No. Wow. <laughs> so unanimous knows there, but yeah, so this one does not get the golden seal of approval. Any last thoughts before we uh, wrap this one up? Seriously, go watch Ringu. Like I said, like we all said, the ending of that movie is one of the most fucking terrifying things I've seen. Yes. It's, it's so good. It's quite good. All right. So if you disagree with what we've said, or if you like what we've said, drop us a line. We're on Instagram and Twitter at DOTD Horror. We're also on Facebook. Don't open that door. So that's been it from Justin, Nico, and Dan. Keep yourselves safe. Take care of one another. And please, dear listener, don't open that door. Bye. And no one has shadows and dreams.